Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker, Doug Casey, is the founder of Casey Research. He has been writing a series of novels. Two published ones are Speculator and Drug Load. Author of the bestsellers, Strategic Investing, Crisis Investing, and Crisis Investing for the rest of the 90s. Doug has lived in seven countries and visited over 100 more. He has appeared on scores of major radio and TV shows and remains an active specula speculator in the stock, bond, commodity, and real estate markets around the world. The title of Doug's speech is Shape of Things to Come. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to invite Doug to the podium. Thank you, Rajni. That was uh, an absolutely accurate <clears throat> introduction, except <clears throat> I've lived in 10 countries and visited 155. So I'm actually better than Rajni thinks. Um, OK, it's, it's a stressful thing, giving a speech. So uh, some bad news for those of you who were at Rick's conference. Uh, I'm basically going to say the same thing that I said there. Uh, so some of you are excused if, 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 you, if you were at Rick's conference. Shape of things to come. Why did I call this speech the shape of things to come? That's after H.G. Um, Wells' book that he wrote in the 20s. They made it into a black and white movie in the 30s. Um, he was predicting the future. Uh, I don't think he did terribly well. But um, the fact is, science fiction has always been a much, much better predictor of the future than uh, any think tank uh, at, at any price. And as many of you know, I am basically a solipsist. Uh, many, many varieties of solipsism. But one of the tenets is that anything that you can imagine can probably be done. Uh, so. Wait, let me start out. Shape of things to come. Let's start out with the most obvious thing possible. Uh, how many of you guys, now come on, I want you to play the game with me. Uh, pretend you're members of the peanut gallery. How many of you guys, let's find out. Let's see who each other are. How many of you guys basically support Donald Trump? Oh, it's pretty, that's pretty, I'd say it's the majority. And how many of you all don't basically support the Donald? Okay, no, you guys are outvoted by it's three to one, I would say. What about half out? I support him on half the policies, but not on half. I, uh, that's, the, that's where I come down to, and let me, let me go into this. Okay, so is Donald good or bad? So what we have to do first is we have to define the words good and bad. So uh, good, bad. So what is that? I'll, I'll tell you what I mean when I say good or bad in this context. Good is things that increase personal freedom and general prosperity. Bad is decreases personal freedom and decreases general prosperity. So good things about the Donald. He's a business guy. That's his background, uh, unlike any other politician that I can remember, uh, quite frankly, for uh, many, many years. That's a plus. Um, of course, Herbert Hoover was a business guy, and he was, he was a disastrous uh, president. Just keep that in mind. He's cutting regulations, but just regulations that he doesn't like. And here's the worst part. He's not pulling up the agencies and the laws by the roots and sowing Agent Orange where they came from. He's, he's just you know reducing and modifying, OK. It's a good direction, but it's not going to last. Uh, after pruning them, they're going to grow back bigger. He's a lower tax guy. That's good. But is he? Because Milton Friedman, I, I think, was most famous for pointing this out. You don't have lower taxes as long as government spending goes up. There, it's like a balloon. It's going to you compress it here with lower taxes. It's going to come out someplace else with debt or money printing or whatever. So he's not really a lower tax guy. That's an illusion. And he's an American first guy. These are things that are good about the Donald, OK, according to my definitions. And he's an America first guy. 
Well, okay. Uh, he, he doesn't want to, you know, give away America's substance to the rest of the world. Uh, that's true, but America First is also a nationalist, which is very dangerous. You know, what's the difference between a nationalist, a patriot, and a jingoist? You know, I, I have problems with all of them, quite frankly. Uh, so what's bad about the Donald, okay? The good is a mixed bag. Well, the best thing about him is he's not Hillary. I mean, nobody could argue with that. So, so yeah, that's right, no. Um, so, bad things about the Donald. He has absolutely no core philosophy whatsoever. Uh, he flies by the seat of his pants. Uh, he's um, completely unpredictable for that reason. Uh, he, he overtly believes in high tariffs. Uh, why? Because he has no understanding at all about economics. Uh, knowing something about the real estate business is very, very different from understanding anything about economics, which he does not. He's, he's innocent of that. He believes in low interest rates. Uh, no. What you should believe in is market interest rates. And these low interest rates, these artificially low interest rates, are causing huge distortions and misallocations of capital in the marketplace that are going to guarantee a gigantic uh, depression. Um, and people are thinking, well, he's going to change America. He, the reason people like him is because he's culturally kind of a middle class American. I mean, and people like that, okay? That's, that's a big change. That's a, that's a good thing. But the bad news is that there really is such a thing as the deep state, which is essentially uh, a very loose um, grouping of people that eh, went to the same schools, share the same values, see the world the same way, uh, are in centers, in and around centers of power, uh, top corporate guys, top uh, legislators, top generals, uh, top academics, people like that. They, they all run together, share common interests. That exists, and as long as the deep state exists, the Donald can't possibly succeed. Hell, I, I said uh, when Ron Paul was running for office, even if Ron won, it wouldn't do any make any difference. Why? Because what would happen to him is these guys, the, the, the real, real top, top dogs in the deep state, would sit him down for a meeting and explain how things work. And if he was too radical in his changes, uh, I think they'd kill him, quite frankly. You know, this is funny. When I was talking to a, a very famous guy the other night at Rick's conference, uh, who, who, who knows all these people, he said, William Weld, who was the Libertarian vice presidential candidate, they were having drinks, and he got, he's gotten to know Weld very well, who's a, a, actually a very big deal in the deep state. And he said, yeah, no, there's no question about it. This is, this is Weld, who knows these people. He says, yeah, there's no doubt the Clintons are responsible for, I'd say, someplace on the order of 140 murders. That's an amazing admission from a top politician. Strictly off the record. I guess it's not off the record now. <laughs> but, but maybe I just made that up, okay? And I didn't tell you who said it. Um, so Trump is not going to change the corporate culture of the U.S. That's out of the question. It, it, it's just not going to happen. Uh, and I'll tell you another reason it's not going to happen. I'm of the opinion, increasingly, that the economy is going to collapse. I, I mean, yes, I know. I'm a perma bear because I see the U.S. culturally having, culturally, having been going downhill since the administration of Teddy Roosevelt, who was a disastrous president. Great drinking partner, great camping buddy, fun guy to hang out. I would have loved him personally, but uh, I, I'm sorry that uh, that assassination attempt on him didn't succeed. Uh, but, you know, uh, the, the fact is, is that Trump, uh, let's suppose I'm right, and the economy goes into collapse 
before the election or at the election. What are these people going to do? They're going to blame it on him. Partially, it'll partly be his fault for these economic policies of low interest rates and more debt and so forth. And they'll vote for the alternative. And what's the alternative? Essentially a communist, probably Michelle Obama, because none of these current, the current people are such lightweights. I, I think Michelle is who they're going to put up. That's my guess. Uh, unless we have a war, then they'll find a left-wing general, because I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, oh, and what about the wall? That was, that's supposed to be like the centerpiece for, um, for the Donald. Uh, well, to start with, I understand. You want to keep these unwashed hordes, these masses out uh, that, well, first of all, they've already won, okay? Because, as I've, I've pointed out, there's a, there's a I, think, I think these people are Salvadorians, but I've never asked them, uh, that run a, uh, a Mexican restaurant. Well, maybe they're the same cuisine, basically. Uh, in the little town just down the street from where I live in Aspen. And on their wall, they have a pretty good sized sign about the Reconquista. Talks about, well, that's the reconquest. The Anglos stole California and Arizona and New Mexico and Texas and Colorado uh, from the Latins. And it talks, you know, they're supporting the Reconquista while all these rich gringos are eating in their restaurant. None of them speak Spanish. Well, I don't either, but I can read it pretty well. So that's what's going on. And there's, uh, as Fergus was saying, I, I think it's all true about these people. They're socially conservative, these Latinos, but they're politically very left-wing. So the Re Reconquista is is happening as, as we speak. And when Trump is out, whether it's this year, uh, next year, uh, or four years from now, then you're gonna get an ultra leftist in. Uh, maybe he'll start a war. You know, it's, I, don't, I don't see any way out of it. Uh, anyway, let's go into, there are six areas that I think we have to look at in the shape of things to come. Uh, demographics, where the key word is migration, culture, where the key word is Western civilizations collapsing, economics, where the key word is greater depression, politics, where the key word is statism, uh, military, where the key word is war, and technology, which is really the biggest thing. This was all descending order, but technology is the X factor, it's the big one, and I don't know which way it's gonna go, but it's the real big one. So. These are like the six areas of uh, just civilization that we ought to talk about. If we look at these six areas, we can tell what the shape of things is to come is going to be. Migration. This is the biggest period of migration since the invasion of the, uh, of, of the Huns and the Goths and people like that. There's been nothing like this for a thousand years or more. Uh, so, okay, let's look at the North American situation. The wall is a palliative. It's going to be about as effective. I mean, yeah, it'll stop things. Uh, like if you, you know, build a really nice sand castle with a, a big wall on the ocean. Yeah, it'll last a while. It'll slow down the waves if the waves aren't too big for a while. But it's just a palliative. It's not going to stop anything. They'll go over, under, around, and through it, uh, not counting airplanes and boats and so forth. So forget about that. And the enemy is already within the gates, uh, certainly philosophically, because all the universities are totally conquered by cultural Marxists. And all the stupid young kids are totally imbued with, with these backward values, and they have been since grade school and high school, so it's part of their intellectual GNA. Very hard to change, you know, when things that you've learned your whole life. Uh, I've got some questions, like this woman, Ilan Omar, she's one of 200,000 Somalis, most of them living in and around Minneapolis. How do those people get there? I mean, they're all dirt poor, 
Well, she's not, because her family was part of the Siad Bari dictatorship, uh, awful, one of the worst in the world. So she had plenty of money, but most of them are dirt poor. Who shipped them over here? Who paid their air for and their food and their clothing and all that? It's a mystery. I've never had anybody give me an answer. I guess it was NGOs. But there's probably going to be more of that type of thing. But you know what it amounts to? Uh, one of the biggest things to ever happen in civilization happened in 378 AD. Anybody know what happened in that year? Well, maybe not. I, I'm a, hmm? The Huns came out. Yeah, I think I heard the, it wasn't the Huns, it was, it was the Goths. That was the Battle of Adrianople. And um, before 378, the Roman Empire was already well on its way down. But uh, in 378, uh, and the Goths were already semi-Romanized and crossing the border here and there, and the Roman army was full of Goths and all this type of thing, but uh, these northern barbarians. But uh, the, uh, the Goths wiped out uh, the Eastern Empire's army, and the floodgates opened. And uh, then all the tribes, once that happened, came across the Danube and the Rhine, and by, in 30 years, they overran the capital, Rome itself. But, okay, that can happen. But the whole civilization of the Roman, the Roman culture was washed away uh, in that 30 years. Uh, forget about 476, that's just a, a token. It happened where all the names and the ownership and the rulers and the army, everything. They were all Goths. I don't know what... I don't know what the native Romans were, were doing. I mean, well, the native Romans were long gone. Even the Italians were long gone. Even the, even the people, it, it, it's just amazing. It was, a, it was a culture that lost confidence in itself. Same thing is happening here. But the important thing isn't really what's happening uh, in, uh, that's a good analogy of what's happening uh, everywhere. Because, and the important thing is not what's happening on the American southern border. That's very serious, but it's trivial in the big picture. Why? Because I got a question for you. Riddle me this. By the year 2100, what's going to be the largest city on the planet? Anybody know? Mexico City. No, this is Lagos. It's projected to be 100 million people in Lagos. That's a lot of people. Just in Lagos. What's the second largest city projected to be? This is by the UN. Um, well, that's not a bad guess, but Kinshasa is the answer. And the third largest city, Dar es Salaam. I mean, which used to be just a nice little beach town. You know, when I was there, it was a nice little beach town. Third, we're talking 100 million, 75 million, and 65 million. And Africa, by the year 20, 2100, I don't think this is going to happen. This is what the UN projects, and you, you know what, I, what all of us would think about their projections. But demographics do have a life of their own. I mean, you can project these curves because it's long term and it's about people and all this. 45% of the world's population uh, will be Africans from south of the Sahara. That's because other parts of the world, China and Iran, uh, Western Hemisphere, are, are all basically at or below uh, reproduction rate. So, all right, so why is this a problem? Are, are, am I a racist about Africans? Well, I don't have any particular uh, uh, opinion on that. Like Muhammad Ali said, everybody tends to like people that look like themselves, and he was right. I don't think Muhammad Ali was a racist. He was just a commonsensical guy. Uh, but um, I guess the, the point that I'm making is, is that what are the consequences of that going to be? Because all those Africans will want to get out of Africa. Where are they going? They're going to invade Europe. There's not going to be millions. There's going to be tens of millions. No, there's going to be scores of millions. Uh, well, there could be hundreds of millions of Africans that just overwhelm. I used to say that Europe was going to be a petting zoo for the Chinese. Well, not 
quite. I think the Chinese are going to wind up taking over Africa. And those Africans that stay there are going to wish the white man was back because the Chinese are going to be a lot tougher than the European colonialists will be. But this is going to be a gigantic upset, really a big upset. What are those Europeans going to do? They're not going to machine gun them. Well, I doubt it. I mean, they're, they're too wimpy to, to do that with invaders. So anyway, demographics. This is the big thing in the coming century. Second thing, culture. Western civilization is dying. Uh, in my opinion, Western civilization is the only civilization, the only culture. In West and I'm a, I'm a fan of, 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 uh, of uh, Chinese and other Oriental cultures. Uh, but wait a minute, how, what do we have? I mean, China gave us, I'm a big fan of Taoism and Zen and martial arts. And yoga, yoga's good. Uh, and uh, Mugu Gai Pan, and uh, uh, you know, General Chow's chicken. Those are wonderful. Uh, great cuisine, fantastic cuisine actually. Sushi, these are all good. But that's about the, that's about the limit, to be honest with you. Uh, what the West brought to the world was uh, the concepts and the promotion of freedom of thought, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. These things did not exist in other parts of the world. Um, concept of individualism didn't exist. This is strictly Western. Uh, individualism as opposed to tribalism. Reason as opposed to superstition. Now these are the foundations of Western civilization. But wait a minute, what about the fruits of the foundations? You lay the foundation, you get the fruits. But you don't get the fruits unless you got the tree, okay? And the tree does not exist in the rest of the world. So what are the, what are the fruits? Uh, philosophy, literature, music, art, science, technology. These things don't exist. Well, China is a separate case, okay? But uh, the, rest of, the rest of the world, you can forget about it. Uh, instead, it's being replaced by political correctness and enforced diversity and inclusion as opposed to exclusion. I like, I like exclusive clubs, not in inclusive clubs that look like bus stations. Uh, identity politics, where people view themselves not as individuals, but they view themselves as a member of a political pressure group, generally racial, but can be religious too. Um, so what's the world going to resemble uh, as Western civilization is washed away and replaced by these things? It's going to get worse. Uh, but is it going to be like 1984 or is it going to be like Brave New World? I'll tell you the sci-fi book that is probably the best predictor of the near-term future, Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson. The U.S. and Canada are going to break up into enclaves so that people that, files, if you would. So people that the most important thing to them is their religion, they'll hang together. Or race, they'll hang together. Or collecting dolls, they'll hang together. Or uh, studying butterflies, they'll hang together. As a matter of fact, it's already, I don't consider Americans to be my countrymen. That's just an accident of birth. I consider my friends people that I share values with. And the nice thing about the internet is I can find them all over the world now. Those are my countrymen, not somebody. I don't consider the people that live in the trailer park down the street from Aspen my countrymen. I consider them an act of liability. So, uh, but you know, I don't even know, talk about culture. The Chinese are doing these, um, the social credit system now. You know, you all know about the social credit system, right? So anything you do or say or even think or absolutely who you associate with, it'll either ding your credit score or raise it. So it makes you want to be a good little lamb. So you get a higher score and there's lots of bennies to that and, and lots of problems with having a low score. So I don't know how that's going to change China, but that's coming here, no question about it. No question about it. So I don't know what the effect on the culture is going to be. I don't think it's going to be good in the current context. Okay, demographics, scary, culture, 
scary. Economics, scary. Greater depression, all the distortions and misallocations of capital that have been cranked into the system by these stupid government policies, the Federal Reserve and the rest of it, over decades, but especially the last decade, uh, are gonna have consequences. So I'll, I'm gonna double down. The Greater Depression is on our doorstep. I've thought that for a couple of years. I'm sorry, I've been, it makes me think that actually we're gonna have a crack up boom, to use Mises' term, as they redouble printing money. Uh, first, before the Greater Depression is in evidence. But I don't know which it's going to be, but I do know this. I'll, I'll say this, and I hope I have to eat my words with a fork and spoon. I hope I'm wrong, because I really like good times more than bad times. But, uh, you know, the unpleasantness of 1929 to 1946, I think it's this time around, it's going to be longer and much different and much worse. So, uh, on the bright side, however, uh, you got to remember there's two things about human beings, two things that are very important, why things get better over the long run. And after the Greater Depression is over, why they'll keep getting better, unless we have a, a nuclear war or something even worse than a nuclear war. So, uh, barring that, okay? It's, uh, there's two things. People are like squirrels. They're, we're genetically programmed to produce more than we consume. Not because they understand economics or anything like that, or even because they're very smart. But squirrels, under, squirrels aren't very smart. But they know, I gotta set aside nuts for the winter or I'm gonna starve to death. Well, people, even the stupid ones, kind of understand that. Even the corrupt ones understand that. So everybody tends to produce more than they consume. Builds capital, things get better. But here's the problem. All these governments are gonna destroy their national currencies. And the problem is, is that all these little squirrels saving money, the ones that save, that aren't totally corrupt, what do they save in? They save in dollars, or yuan, or quatches, or pulas, or dirhams, or all these other ridiculous currency units out there. They're all destroyed. So what happens to the savings of that person? They've been dissipated. They disappear. So I guess my cause for optimism about the squirrels is perhaps misplaced. The second thing is science and technology, okay? There happen to be, remember this, this is important, there are more scientists and engineers alive today than have lived in all the Earth's history put together. Most of them are Chinese, as a matter of fact, but that's fine, it doesn't matter. Uh, they're all, you know, doing what scientists and engineers do and making the world better. So, okay, I'm, I'm giving you the counter theme to my Greater Depression uh, prediction and why I hope I'm wrong. Economics, bad, grim. Uh, so far, three out of three. Politics, okay, uh, the key there, statism. And let me draw your attention to the fact that 100 years ago, uh, nowhere in the world do they have income tax or sales tax or VAT, well, roughly 100 years ago. Uh, and a lot, taxes were very low. In fact, government was just an occasional nuisance. Yeah, okay, they'll have a war or a pogrom or a confiscation once in a while. People understood that was like a storm blowing through. But the government wasn't really much of a, an influence in your life other than those things. <clears throat> but, um, and governments, they put up with them out of tradition and because governments kind of offered protection against, you know, the government next door, basically. Um, but now, uh, statism has taken over the world. The nature of politics has changed from what it was in the days when we were making huge advances you know, across the board uh, throughout the Western world. Because we've only made advances in the Western world, I think. Uh, why do I say that? Because if civilization is so degraded that a 
a, a rather mediocre to low intelligence 29-year-old Puerto Rican waitress can come out of nowhere and set the agenda for the U.S., you know something's wrong. And that's a factual statement. That's a factual statement. I mean, you've got this goofball and, and her buddies in the gang of four, you know, setting the rules. Uh, and I'll tell you why it's going to get worse, not better. It's not just that everybody who goes, it used to be nobody, few people went to college. And college, you actually learned things in the old days. But now, everybody goes to college, you don't learn anything, and you're all indoctrinated by the Marxists. They've totally taken over the universities. But it's worse than that. That's, it's worse than that. Because all of these countries have legislatures. And what do legislatures do? And city councils and states and provinces, they all, do the, they all have legislatures. They pass more laws. They're supposed to do something and pass more laws. But the old laws don't go away. The new laws are added on. So that's why it's getting worse every day. When is that going to stop? I don't know, but trends in motion tend to stay in motion until a genuine crisis changes things. So uh, I don't know. And as far as the U.S. is concerned, I think it's, uh, it feels like it's on the cusp of a civil war because these blue people and red people, they hate each other. They really hate each other. There's no communication. They can't even talk to each other. This is much worse than it ever was in the 1960s when the things like this were going on. In fact, I think it's much worse than it was before the unpleasantness of 1861 to 1865. But we won't have a civil war, uh, I don't think. Why? Because about half of the country is on Prozac or Zoloft or uh, uh, there's a hundred of these things, a hundred of them. So half the country is like a walking zombie from that point of view. And the other half is in their mom's basement playing video games all day. They don't care. So it's probably not as serious as I thought, but the politics is poisonous. So that's four out of four, bad news. Well, what about the military? Now, one thing about Americans that they all agree on, or at least they better agree on, is that we love our troops, we love our military. Look, the, the military today is full of refugees from the ghettos and the barrios and the trailer parks. Uh, I understand the value of the military. It's the same as it was during the days of Rome. Join the military, it gives you a chance to get up and out. Okay, I, I can see that. But um, basically, yeah, you learn some good habits. Say yes, sir, yes, ma'am, uh, occasionally. Uh, but you uh, shine your shoes, make your bed. Okay, uh, it's positive for these people. But uh, on the other hand, you get in the habit of uh, doing what you're told from people of questionable morality. Uh, and as a matter of fact, apart from that, the average American citizen uh, doesn't have any relationship to the military. Nobody goes in the military, frankly, today, unless they have to. And what does the military, there's two things the military can do. One, it, it look for a war. That's what these generals are all about. They realize they're worthless unless they get into a war. That's how they get famous and so forth. And if they don't, or even especially if they do, they'll bankrupt the country. Trillion dollars a year of military spending and the chance of creating a real war. I'm not talking about a sport war like with, uh, you know, the Afghans or the Iraqis. I mean, that's just, that's just you know, uh, play around, have a good time. I mean, major game like Iran or super major game like China. I mean, these people, people are capable of that. And you, why, what's the reason why we might have a war? Because as things start falling apart economically in the U.S., Governments like to unite the country. For some reason, that's positive. Unite the country. I don't know why. It's bad news to me. But uh, they know that a war unites the country, and uh, maybe they'll start one for just that reason. Now, the last thing. Oh, am I running? Oh, I got two minutes. Oh, that's too bad. Because uh, I was going to cover the big thing, which was technology. That's the X factor. 
Uh, I'm a believer in uh, Moore's Law, basically that technology doubles every year in speed and costs go in half. It hasn't been going on just since the 1960s, though. it's been going on for at least 200,000 years. But it's like a hyperbolic exponential curve, so that's a real, real slow. Uh, learn to make fire, 100,000 years go by. Ah, uh, learn to nap flint, uh, 20,000 years go by. Learn to make an atlatl, 20,000 more, 10,000 more, a bow, domesticate the dog, domesticate the horse. And nothing really was happening until the end of the Paleolithic 12,000 years ago. Neolithic, uh, villages, agriculture, domestic cattle. Now things are moving much faster, developments every decade. 200 years ago, industrial revolution. New innovations, huge innovations every year maybe every couple of months. And now, there's new things, because remember, every, more scientists and engineers and all of history put together, daily, there's a dozen things that are, that are happening. So it's like a, you're in a stadium, okay? Uh, I'll end it here, just about. Give me another minute. Uh, but I'm not gonna tell you what to do. This is really, Rick, you should be up here. This is how you shine one shoe and then they got to come to you to shine the other shoe. Uh, so what, what's, what's happening is, you, say you're in a giant stadium and there's a drop of water at the bottom. You don't notice it. An hour later, there's two drops. You don't notice that. 59 minutes later, four drops. 58 minutes later, eight drops. Okay, nobody knows, nobody cares. Until you can see a sheen on the bottom of the stadium and now, it's doubling like every 10 seconds then five seconds. So by the time you see the sheen of water, it's too late for you to avoid drowning. You can't get out of the stadium in time. And that's what's happening with technology. Artificial intelligence, that's gonna be very interesting. World of the Terminator. Biotech and genetic engineering, that's gonna to totally disrupt families and everything else, and, and labor too. Space technology. Time to get off of this planet. If I could do it, I'd do it tomorrow morning. But I don't want to live in a tin can. I, I want to, I want to live in a, you know, science fiction idyll. Uh, robotics, that's going to be huge when we have biological robots. And um, nanotechnology, by far the biggest thing. It's going to change the whole planet uh, unrecognizably and totally. And uh, that's, that's a really big one, but nobody's still talking about that. So anyway, that's the shape of things to come. The technology thing could be very good, could be very bad, depends. But the other five things, pretty grim. So, uh, okay, here's your little adventure in sci-fi for the day. Hope you, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>